Thank you for listening to the Matt's Movie Reviews podcast, available on iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, and Stitcher. Also, please follow Matt's Movie Reviews on Facebook, YouTube, Parlor, and Instagram. And of course, be sure to visit www.mattsmoviereviews.net for the latest reviews, top 10 lists, and more. Now, on to the show. Stone is a trip. And when you're on a bike, I mean a big bike, you've got all power, man. The grave diggers are on the move. A new breed of motorbike gang. That's why we're here, man, together. Because when you're out there right. With the grave diggers, what can stop us, man? What can stop us? We own the world. They live in a fortress by the sea. Vietnam veterans. With their own style of life. Their own rules. Their own religion. Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I am your host, Matthew Perkovich, and this is episode number 339. Out now on DVD, digital, and special edition Blu-ray is Stone, the 1974 Australian cult classic that stars Ken Shorter as a cop who goes undercover with a notorious bike gang known as the Grave Diggers to investigate who is killing their members. Directed by Sandy Harbert, Stone was the release to box office success in much controversy while paving the way for movies like Mad Max to thrive on the world stage. And joining me now on the Matt's Movie Reviews podcast is Roger Ward, one of the stars of Stone and an Australian film legend who has films such as Mad Max and Turkey Shoot to his name. Roger, it is an honour to have you on my podcast and I thank you very much for joining me today. Well, thanks, Matt. Thanks for inviting me to come on board. Uh, it's a you know, great pleasure to talk about these old films. Uh, they are pretty old, actually. <laughs> They're getting into the 50-year mark. Well, whatever. But it's nice to talk about them. I had no idea it would happen when we made them, of course. You know. Well, here's a film that is reaching that anniversary, but it's still a film that has an impact, which I think is really important. I'm just curious, though, back in that time, 19, early 1970s, 73, 74, was there an Australian film industry per se? I know there were films like the Barry McKenzie films, the Alvin Purple movies, more kind of like your comedic, uh, sex comedies of that regard but a film like stone what was that like in that whole time was there anything like that like action cinema was there even a car chase on on big screens not really although i at that period or before that period like the late 60s we were doing a lot of films with the americans the, the americans came out here to do television films mm-hmm. and uh i was lucky enough to befriend the director um an older guy uh Eddie, I can't think of his last name, but he'd come out here every year, uh, maybe twice a year. He'd give me a call and say, Roger, I've got a movie coming up. You know, I would like you in it. You can play the cop. He, uh, he's he got 30 days on the film. You can play the villain. Uh, he's got 35 days. You know, he would he'd just nominate the days, not the character. And I'd say, well, look, I'll take the, the 35 day. I'll take the one with 35 days because, yes. you know, I meant more money. So that's the way he worked. He didn't audition. He just knew what you could do and you could play, you know, two or three different roles in the film. So that happened quite often over the years, like the late sixties into the beginning. So there were films, yeah. And they were American films. So they weren't really seen here. They were done for television, American television. And uh, so we, there was films and there was television. We were doing uh, a lot of that, a lot of car chases in Crawford Productions and so on, uh, you know, Homicide, Division 4. Uh, we were doing all that. Stone was a unique film for Australia. Yeah, unusual. Many people regard it as the first Australian bikey movie. And and at that time in the States, the biker film was very very prevalent. Started with The Wild One with Brando. Then you had the films with Peter Fonda in the 60s. The films like that, were they very popular in Australian cinemas at the time and with um, with Australian actors like yourselves? They, 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 what was that? Were they popular? You're saying? What yes, were they popular with Australian audiences and also with actors like oh. yourself? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, a lot of actors uh, at that time were very actor. You know, I'm an actor. I, I wouldn't do that sort of trash 
So, I mean, a lot of the actors had that old English feel about them and they wouldn't do a film like this, possibly, because they weren't asked. You know, maybe that's the reason they were so uppity about it. So a lot of the actors wouldn't have done it or couldn't have done it because they couldn't ride a motorbike. A lot of, a lot of these actors were pretty hopeless in that physical area. They were just actors. And uh, so there were only a certain amount of actors that could have done that type of film. And we, <laughs> there's a group of us, about 20 or 30 of us, would meet every Friday night at a certain hotel in Sydney and have a conflab and a bit of a party. And that's where most of the casting was done. So the, uh, the rough and ready actors, the ones that were prepared to do a film like that were in a group, like a, a, a camaraderie. And so we were there and Sandy said to me one night at the hotel, he said, look, I'm doing a film about bikers. Will you want to be in it? I said, yeah, sure, love to. Because I, I was a motorbike rider since mm -hmm. I was 17. And, uh, you know, so Sandy mixed with that type of person that would do that sort of film. But there were other actors out there that wouldn't have even looked at the film. Oh my God, no, I can't do that. You know, give yeah. me Shakespeare. And uh, so there was a bit of a snobbishness, snobbishness about it. Uh, but of course, once the film hit the airwaves and it became successful, then everybody said, oh my God, you know, well, maybe I should have done that film. And, uh, but I just did it because it was just another film. But in actual fact, I've, after I found out I was talking to you, um, I did a bit of research because I've done a few interviews about Stone and I've always sort of never took much notice of Stone really. Uh, it was just a film to me and I never really did much research on it and just spoke about what I remembered. But with the Blu-ray coming out and I've done a lot of interviews about Stone, I was just, you know, going off the top of my head. So finally I went down the shed yesterday Mm -hmm. to get my diaries out from the 1970s and well, I found the diaries there from the 1960s actually but uh, um, I found the ones for 90 and I didn't even know Stone was done in 73 I thought it was done in 72 hmm. so that's how much I cared about it and I, I actually wrote a biography some time ago and I went through the biography looking to see what I said about Stone and I didn't say one word about Stone so that's how much it influenced me not at all to me it was just another film and of course as it grew in such over the years i started to remember vaguely about it and sort of talked and said oh well we made it in 72 but in actual fact no we made it in 73 mm. and as i say i dragged my uh, diary out and i've got a couple of little notes here if you don't mind i'll tell them i'll tell it to you that yes. on the on the 7th of september 7th of september 1973 despite the fact that i've spoken to sandy about it in the pub uh, Brian Trenchard Smith, you know, Brian Trenchard Smith, he directed Man from Hong Kong and Turkey Shoot and yes. many yeah. others. Well, Brian was a friend of mine uh, through making films with him prior to Man from Hong Kong. We made The Stunt Men and a few others, uh, documentary type films. Well, I, uh, Brian invited me to a party at his house on the 7th of September, 73. And who was there? David Hannay and Sandy Harbutt, deliberately there. He had invited them along as well. And that's when they laid it on me about Stone and said, look, we want you in the film. You know, we've discussed it at the pub and all that, but this is official. We want you in the film. And so I said, yeah, I'll do it. I'd love to do it. And we discussed money and so on. I signed the contract on the 2nd of October, 73. So that's when we actually started the ball rolling, 2nd of October, 73. But uh, on the 5th of October, that couple of days later, I went for a fitting of the wardrobe. Uh, Hella Morse, by the way, was wardrobe lady. Hella mm -hmm. Morse is a great actress, you may not know, but she was very, very famous uh, in the uh, in the 80s, 70s, 80s. She was quite famous as a very, very, very lovely actress, lovely. And she was Sandy's wife, and she was wardrobe lady on the film. So I went for a fitting of a wardrobe, which was just jeans and a sweat and a shirt, you know. And I said, to, I said to Helen, can I dress myself up a bit? You know, I want to look the part and she said yeah here's ten dollars here's here's the budget ten dollar budget go and fix yourself up so off i went and i bought i bought um that cap i wore you i wore a cap with a red band on it mm -hmm. uh, and i uh, bought boots and footy socks and gloves and earrings and uh, i think i might have exceeded the ten dollar budget but uh, at least i bought them and that i dressed myself up with that and uh, so that was it and uh, Next thing we know, we were, uh, went to a place at Seven Hills to learn how to ride the bikes. Not that I needed to learn, but a lot of the actors hadn't ridden bikes and others needed a bit of a brush up. 
Yeah. And so that was it. Um, 73, October and November um, was when the film was made. You know, Stoney's held in really high regard um, by bikies and bikey culture back then and today as well. You just mentioned you rode yourself. What did you know about bikey culture about that time? And did any of your, you know, did anything that you thought about bikey culture was challenged or changed when you started hanging around with real bikers on that film set? Because there's quite a bit of Hell's Angels actually were participating in the production of that movie. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I, I even I rode a bike and I rode with my brother and I rode with a gang. We called ourselves the Big Five. We had our own little gang called the Big Five and the five of us. And uh, but we never actually joined a club as such. We didn't know what we heard about the Hells Angels, but we didn't take any notice of that. And we never, ever saw any violence or anything like that that you would think may be associated to bikers. <clears throat> so I didn't know about the culture of bikers. No when I joined the club. And we, we, I think the first day of shooting was at the Fourth and Clyde. And that day that the bikers arrived, the, the Hells Angels, that was the Fourth and Clyde Hotel at Balmain. Uh, it was the first day of shooting actually. And uh, it was on a Saturday and uh, all the Hells Angels turned up. Well, I'd never seen a site like that before. Maybe, mm. maybe 150, 200 of them turned up riding down the street all out of their, off their tiny minds on drugs or, or grog and they're literally falling off their motorbikes at our feet, you know. Yeah. And so that was quite an entrance. And our girls, we had models and actresses working with us who rode on the bikes with us, um, bikey moles as such. Uh, they were, they loved them. They said, oh, my God, look at the Hells Angels. Aren't they wonderful? <laughs> you know, they thought, oh, they're gorgeous. I mean, aren't they gorgeous? I mean, these guys are filthy, dirty. They've got scruffy old beards. Their, their clothing's all torn. Uh, but they thought they were wonderful. So I uh, I got a bit probably jealous, you know, because they were our girls, you know. Uh, you got to the stage where, as a biker, they were our girls, and I didn't like them. The idolizing these Hells Angels, so I abused the Hells Angels. I got up on the balcony at the hotel and uh, and abused them. Uh, and uh, everybody thought, oh my God, you know, we're going to get kicked to death now. You don't do that to the Hells Angels. But the Hells Angels respected me for it. Mm. And uh, and they became, well, one in particular became so friendly that he came to my house every day for two weeks. Just I couldn't get rid of him. He just visited me, visited me. He just loved me because of my attitude. He said, you know, the, you're the only one with any class around here. And then what they mean by that was anybody with any well, balls, I guess. And they admired that in me. And uh, he, he just loved me. But uh, he, I actually met him many years later, 25, 30 years later, that particular guy. And uh, he's turned into a very religious and unassuming quiet guy but he was a wild uh, wild man then in those days you know that particular guy i want to talk a bit about sandy hubbard um he unfortunately passed away last november stone will forever go down as this man's singular vision brought to the screen he directed the film he wrote the film he starred in the movie as the undertaker um, so many other facets of the film he did as well. When you work with a filmmaker like that, what is it like? Does he have a singular vision that you have to stick to? Does he allow improvisation on the script or was the production time, was the budget and was his kind of approach to filmmaking, does, that not, does he not allow that? And do you have to go verbatim what's on the page when it comes to that movie? Yeah, well, Danny did want you to stick to the script pretty much, yeah. He wrote the script, he co-wrote the script actually. Uh, and uh, but he was quite adamant that we would say the lines as he wrote them. He, he's quite a, an officious type of guy, lovely guy offset, uh, lovely guy socially, but you put him in front of a camera or behind a camera and uh, he's uh, and a very officious, uh, very singular minded guy and uh, uh, very aggressive and uh, too aggressive for his own size actually. But um, I, I just looking at my diary, as I said, and I noticed there that he abused um, Dewey Hungerford, who was uh, one of the bikers, he played the Yank, a septic, they called him septic. Mm. And he, he uh, and, and I noticed in the diary that, uh, that Dewey said something wrong on the uh, script and Sandy literally yelled out, shut up. And Dewey said, what, what, what did I do wrong? You know, just shut up. Mm. And Sandy said, you know, oh, that sort of aggression, which is not <laughs> conducive to actors, <clears throat> but conducive to bikers, you see. 
So Sandy was treating us all. Well, I must say not me, because I knew Sandy for a long time and uh, he never ever abused me. I mainly because I knew what I was doing and I did exactly what was wanted. But those bikers that weren't actors or those actors that hadn't had much experience who happened to ride a bike, <coughs> he abused the hell out of those and treated them very badly. Yeah, he, he, he was very disrespectful. Stone is forever known as his one and only movie, which is really surprising considering the influence and the success that film had. Did that aggression that Sandy had, um, is that something that really butted heads with people in the industry? Is that why films were not made, even though he put in different submissions to, I think at then um, it was the Australian Film Development Corporation, which is pretty much what Screen Australia is now, right? It's a government body that gives investing. Did he butt heads with people in that? And is that aggressive nature um, that he had is what kind of led to him not kind of having a full career that many expect him to have? Yeah, that was certainly his downfall. His mouth, his mouth was his downfall. Um, I've been in, I've been in the, I've been in the offices of uh, British Empire Films talking about another film. Uh, I think it was probably Man from Hong Kong that was coming up. I was in one office with one executive, and Sandy was about three offices away with the mm -hmm. managing director of British Empire Films, and Sandy was literally swearing like a wharf labourer, shouting his head off. And it was just echoing throughout the whole building. And uh, I, I thought, what the hell is going on over there? And I realized, I heard the voice and I realized it was Sandy. And Sandy was screaming abuse at the managing director because of his lack of uh, respect for the film or his lack of uh, decision to distribute the film. Whatever it was, Sandy had lost his, lost his cool and just abused the hell out of this man like a, as if he was in a, in a gutter. Uh, with a, having a street fight, you know, it was just un un unbelievable. And that's the sort of attitude that Sandy had to everybody, uh, even the production people like, you know, he did get money from the Australian Film Commission. I think he got 180 or 140 or something. So whatever the budget he got, he did get that money to mm. make Stone. And he didn't go much over budget. He sort of pretty well, what money they gave him, he made the film with that figure. But that was raised by David Hanay, who was the producer of the film and actually uh, David got into the business through me I got him a job um, on my I wrote a book years ago called The Set and uh, and David met me on a film set as an actor and said to me oh you wrote The Set I said yeah he said I believe it's being produced and I said yeah uh, he said could I would you introduce me to the producer because I want to be a producer he was an actor then mm -hmm. but he was also an, you know he was an accountant and so on he'd studied uh, finance at the university so he was in the field to be a producer and I introduced him to Frank Britton who produced and directed my film or my book and David became executive in charge of production on the set which was wasn't executive producer but it was an executive in charge of the production <clears throat> and he went from there so David always said to me you are responsible for me being in this business like this is whenever I asked for a raise. Like yes. I did a lot of films with David. And if ever I said to David, David, I need more money than that. And David would say to me, you are responsible for me being in this chair. I can't give you any more money. So David used that as a lever to uh, not pay me what I, should, what I wanted. But so David had much more tact, uh, much more refined. And he was the man that, uh, that um, Sandy should have let you know raise money or talk business but no sandy wanted to be the man wanted to be the main man and and it was his downfall stone had its uh premiere 28th of june 1974 it was at the forum theater in sydney which is not around anymore um oh, that movie the premiere you were all there cast and crew but also the hills angels uh were there um there was another biker group as well i forgot they were called i think it was, um uh just um, losing out. Anyway, um, so I'm sure there's another biker group there as well. What was that experience like to have a premiere with a whole bunch of real life bikers watching the movie? Um, I mean, is it as rowdy as I imagine it would have been? Oh yeah, it's exciting, exciting time. <clears throat> I've, I've seen uh, I've seen some newsreels of it. I don't remember uh, the incident uh, at all. I've been to a lot of movie premieres in my time and that particular one I don't remember, but I do remember now seeing the uh, the newsreel of it and I turned up dressed up in fancy clothes and the girl I took she wore a top hat I remember plus 
very brief pants. What, what date did you say it was in July? Got... It was June 28th, 1974. June. I'll just have a look. At, I've got my diary here. 28th, you said. Did you? Yes, sir. And I remember now it's the Gypsy Jokers were the other bikey gang that were there that night. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've got here um, Stone Premier last night. The Premier went well. I hired an outlandish outfit of white satin. Hmm. Mm. That's me. That's your idea. And uh, with, uh, I wore my uh, jacket, my stone jacket, above the lot. We were inundated uh, by the press and drinks and so on. Yeah, so it was lovely. Uh, I just said we were inundated with the press and it was quite a nice night. But yeah, it was good. But I just remember later uh, when, when Stone was opening in Adelaide and uh, Sandy said to me, oh, I, I come from Adelaide originally. Yes. So Sandy said to me, could you organise something in Adelaide? Uh, we're coming down to do stone. I, I, I did. I went to every bikey that I could find, uh, went to pubs and street corners, and I got every bikey that I could contact and said, listen, can you come down to the Adelaide airport on such and such a time, on such and such a date? We've got the director of the film called Stone arriving. And they all agreed. And Sandy turned up at, say, 3.30 on the afternoon. And I had about 150 bikers there. They just turned up like it was like birds, like the like the the birds in Hitchcock's film, the birds, mm -hmm. the motorbikes were just coming and drifting into the airport. I couldn't believe it. And I was dressed up in my outfit, my costume from the show, and uh, I was you know manhandling the whole thing. And Sandy got off the plane; he couldn't believe it. So we had a, a spare bike for Sandy, and we gave him the motorbike, and he rode at the head of the pack, and one other biker on a on a big or oh, one thousand cc Douglas, a great big heavy bike. He could just put it up on the back wheel as easy as that. And he rode behind Sandy on his back wheel for God, a good quarter of a mile, half a mile. And the press were there, of course. I, I got the press. Anyway, it was a great opening for that. And, and of course, the Adelaide premiere went very well. But then we had to go to a nightclub to do some more publicity. Mm -hmm. And we all, it was only about eight of us went, including Sandy. And we're all in our biker gear. And we went to the nightclub where we, they were expecting us. But the bouncers weren't told. And the bouncer said, oh, you can't come in here like that. And I said, oh, look, I'm sorry, mate, but we're, we're here. The management expects us. We're doing some publicity for this film. But Sandy suddenly said, ah, bugger, I'm not going to be talked to these, by these idiots. You can, you know, slam your bloody show up your ring. And he abused the hell out of these bikers and took off. Now, all the work that I put into getting publicity for Sandy in Adelaide was just blown out the window by Sandy's attitude. He just mm. took off stormed off and I, I just gave up so that's the attitude of sandy it wasn't it wasn't the thing to do when you're trying to raise uh, well get people to see your film and also get interest in your film but it did take on a life of its own despite sandy but no one ever gave him any money ever again no. the film sure did take on a life in its own it was breaking box office records, extremely popular and released, critical acclaim, not so much, but over the years that has changed most definitely. A lot of people talk about Stone, about being the precursor to films like Mad Max. You appeared in Mad Max as well. When you're on set, did um, George Miller ever mention it, the, the film to you in, in any kind of way? No, no, never mentioned Stone at all. And I didn't give it, a, I, didn't, I didn't link it. I didn't have no, any connotation to, between the two. As I said, Stone was just another film to me, and 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 uh, so was Mad Max actually. So I never even gave it a thought. And uh, uh, I mean, it's mostly cars in Mad Max, as you know. A lot of, well, I mean, cars and motorbikes, but cars were featured pretty heavily. <clears throat> no bike, no cars in in Stone uh, that I can remember. And uh, so no, I never gave it a thought. Uh, but looking back on it now, I should imagine that George was influenced by it. Yeah. And he, as you say, he did use a few of the actors from from Stone in 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 Mad Max. You know, it's really interesting. A lot of the films that you've been in have been reimagined or remade. Turkey Shoot, for example, that was remade in uh, 2014. You appeared in that too. Mad Max, the franchise, came back to life a few years ago. Do you think Stone has a possibility of perhaps being remade again for a feature film or perhaps even a, a TV series, especially considering? over the last decade, especially in Australia, bikey walls have become more prevalent probably than ever. There is interest in that subject. Do you think a film like Stone could be redone for a new generation? Or do you think this is a film that's etched in stone, pardon the pun, uh, in 1974? Well, Sandy never condoned anyone else making another film of Stone. People come up to me 
so they must have come to Sandy. I've got this great idea for a second film of Stone. I've got this wonderful idea. And a couple of them were quite impressive. And I rang Sandy and said, Sandy, this guy spoke to me about a remake of Stone. And to me, it sounds pretty good. Do you want to speak to him? And Sandy said, no, no, mate, no, no. I sold the rights to film. I've sold the rights to Stone. I don't, I don't own it anymore. Mm. And I don't want to know about it. He claimed he'd sold the rights to it. But if anybody ever tried to do anything about Stone, like a bit of publicity or anything that Sandy didn't know about, he'd jump on his bandwagon and say, you can't do that. They tried it with me, for God's sake. Uh, two years ago, I was, uh, somebody asked me to do some publicity for Stone and said, you can come along and sell your photographs. Some function they had, and they said, come along, sell your photographs and sign a few autographs. And, and I said, yeah, sure. Next thing I got a phone call, not from Sandy, but from one of his aides, saying, you know, you can't do that. I said, I beg your pardon. They said, you can't, you can't do that. You, you've got no right to do that. I said, yeah, you told me 10 years ago that you'd sold the rights to Stone. Now you're trying to tell me I can't do, sign a photograph with my image on there, for God's sake. Mm. I'm an actor and I'll do what I have to do to make a living. Don't talk to me ever again about that. So they shut up and didn't do anything about it. But he was still trying to control people. That was like, 30 years later, at least 30 years later, you're still trying to control his actors and telling him what to do. But in answer to your question about another, this, um, I don't know if you can see that, uh, that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a script yes. uh, called uh, uh, Welcome to Hell, 903 Welcome to Hell. Now this writer came to me at the beginning of this year, actually at Sandy's, at Sandy's um, funeral. Uh, I, I met him at Sandy's funeral. He came down from Queensland and to be at the funeral. And we got talking and he said he was a writer and he'd written a script on Stone. And I pricked my ears up that, oh yeah, another one, you know. But he said, Sandy has authorized it. Sandy has said, yes, it's a great film. I'd love you to make it and I want to be in it. Mm -hmm. Like this was like two years before he died. Sandy said, I want to be in it. I want to play this particular role. And uh, so I pricked my ears up. And then he said that Sandy said, look, I can't raise the money for it. You better go and speak to David Hannay. So the guy rang David and I, this is just before David died. David died seven years ago. So all this must have happened at least eight or 10 years ago. And he rang David and David said, oh no, I don't want to know about it. I've got 20,000 scripts on my desk at the moment mm. and I don't want another one. And the guy said, well, Sandy said, you should read it because it's about stone. So David said, well, I'll send it up, send it up. But apparently a week later, David rang this particular writer and said, you've just gone from 20,000th to number one. I love it. Let's make it. Mm. Now, this is only hearsay from this guy telling me this. So then he went to Roadshow, uh, not Roadshow. Uh, oh, yeah, it was Roadshow. He went to Roadshow and they said, what, uh, you know, what, what is so important about this film that we should make it? And this guy said, look, we've been sitting here for an hour talking about this particular film. And uh, there's been a, th a thousand cars have gone by your window and you didn't, you didn't even look up. What would you have done if a thousand motorcyclists, motorcyclists went past your window? Mm. She said, oh, I would have jumped to the window and looked out to see what he said, there you go. She said, yeah, you're right. Yeah, maybe you're right. So, but then the roadshow went broke again. This is his story. So that was it. This, this, so this script is still there, not been made. And he asked me to have a go at it. But the trouble is, I, I write and edit as well, you see, that's why he asked me. Mm. Um, it's 237 pages long. I mean, that's a film script, 237 pages. I mean, usually a film script is 90 to 120. This is 237. It's far too long for a film script. And I told the guy, but he got offended. He said, Sandy Harvard authorised it. David and I authorised it. Roadshow authorised it. How dare you tell me that I can't do it? So I said, Okay, mate, you're on your own. Do what you want. So I, I washed my hands of the whole thing. You know, if you can't help them, uh, you know, you don't join them. So that was it. But so in answer to your question, no, there's been no films made about Stone and Sandy put a dampener on any suggestion in the early days. And now it's getting pretty long in the tooth. I, I, don't, I don't see it happening. No. Mm. Well, we still have the 1974 film. And look, I've watched it again recently. I still love the film. I remember the first time I watched it, I must have been... Oh, God, 15, 16, it was on SBS one night. Um, 
totally gripped me, watched it again, same thing again. And I'm so glad to have in my hand right now the um, special edition Blu-ray. Um, so wow. everyone out there, Stone, available, Blu-ray, DVD, also on digital. And the special edition Blu-ray is fantastic. It's got um, the documentary Stone Forever came out in 1999. Um, it's got Quentin Tarantino talking about the film. It's got the original soundtrack included as well. Um, great packaging. It's fantastic. And uh, Roger Ward, speaking of fantastic, this conversation with you has been a highlight. Um, I do thank you very much for your time and thank you as, as well from all Australian film fans for all the great work you've done over the years as well um, in our industry and thanks again for joining me today. Lovely, thanks man, I appreciate that very much, thank you. Lovely, talk to you later and